Princess Morgan is slapped to the ground by the king for treating her stepmother with contempt and calling her a whore. Fifteen years ago, Morgan was banished and confined to a nunnery for not agreeing with her father's decision to install a new queen. Though the fifteen years of exile have made Morgan strong, King Other decides to sever his ties with his daughter, whom he believes has been out of his control for too long. Faced with a father who has turned his back on her, Morgan, who considers herself the king's only child, stops stops acting like a wimp and begins her ambitious and lustful quest for vengeance. In order to ascend to the throne, Morgan uses witchcraft to change her appearance, and then sneaks into her father's party and poisons his food. King Other, unsuspectingly, eats the poison food and collapses right afterwards. With her vengeance exacted, Morgan looks up grinning like a devil and makes her next move. Merlin, the magician, said something was wrong and rushed back to the palace. But he was too late. King Other had already been poisoned and was about to die. So Merlin took out a will and gave it to King Other. And the boy. King Other signed the will before he died. Merlin then removed the ring on his hand, a symbol of power, and set off for a distant village. Based on Caldic mythology, the series centers on the chaotic battle for the throne, following the death of King Other of Camelot. Princess Morgan is in mourning, but has no intention of mourning her father. She hates her father for killing her own mother to marry the new queen, and he banished her for ten years. So Morgan plotted her revenge in order to gain the throne she'd longed for, but Morgan knew she wouldn't be able to do it on her own. So she brought in her father's greatest enemy, King Lot. Morgan saw Lot's cooperation and marriage in the name of her being King Other Solaire. If we forge a union, we'd have the strength to unite the realm as king and queen. Morgan then used her seductive body to capture Lot. The two of them aligned themselves on the same side, and then she was the victor who drove her hated stepmother out of the kingdom. I did nothing to harm you. Indeed, my lady, you did nothing. You did nothing when my mother was murdered so that you could take her place. And you did nothing when my father banished me. Even though it was her father who hurt Morgan the most, she couldn't forgive her stepmother for watching and sent her out of the palace herself. Shortly after sending her stepmother away, a soldier delivered a message from Merlin. Merlin wanted Morgan to go to the old castle of Camelot to meet King Other's son. Who's his son? That's what I was told to deliver. He has a son. I have the only true claim to the throne. This is Merlin's game. So we'll play with him. What Morgan didn't know was that Merlin had traveled to a secluded village to find King Other's only son, near a stream. A man and a woman were touching the mysteries of their bodies, when they were suddenly disturbed by a shout. They immediately got up and dressed. Arthur was then slapped in the face by the man behind him. After a few moments of fighting, the two men are stopped by this beautiful woman. How did you find us? I know where you put your girls. Now mine too. Arthur, the protagonist of the story, was meeting a woman by the river and was interrupted by his brother Kay. Due to a visitor to the house, Arthur doesn't know that his life of indulgence is coming to an end. When Arthur returns home, he is perplexed to see the stony expressions on his parents' faces. Until a bald man appears with news he can't believe. The king is dead. Murdered. Son? You. Ah, oh, with this son. Arthur laughed absurdly at that answer. However, when he turns around and sees the evasive look in his parents' eyes, he instantly realizes that Merlin wasn't joking. His father finally told Arthur the truth. Merlin delivered him to the couple when he was less than a week old. It turned out that Arthur was really King Other's illegitimate son. He was given to the couple over ten years ago and raised. Since King Other was dead, Merlin wanted to bring Arthur back to the throne, but Arthur couldn't accept his origins for a while. When Merlin gave him King Other's suicide note and ring, Arthur was convinced, but it didn't want to leave his adopted parents, who had raised him, or his county little village. His brother Kay gave him a great deal of encouragement. What you're being offered is better. Going to battle, leading the land. That's what every man dreams of. No. Why shouldn't it be your destiny? If it was me, I'd go. Arthur finally decided to accept his mission and follow Merlin to the throne. But it asked to take his brother Kay with him to the palace. And so the three of them raced back to the dangerous capital. On the way, Arthur asked him about his origins. And Merlin smiled and told a story that was a little old. More than ten years ago, King Other fell in love with the wife of a rival duke. Unable to defeat his rival, King Other changed his strategy. King Other asked Merlin to use sorcery to transform him into his rival duke's likeness, to confuse the woman he loved. And it was that night that Arthur was conceived. After a few more days and nights of traveling, they finally arrived at the castle of Camelot. Merlin had already gathered his men who had served King Other. 
From this moment on, they were loyal to King Arthur's only son, Arthur. Arthur obviously didn't understand anything, but after all, he had come here, so he had to accept this fact for the time being. Princess Morgan, who had received Merlin's invitation, came to the castle with her new alliance with King Lot. Morgan's main reason for coming was to confirm the identity of the bastard. No, my father had no legitimate son. We can work together to honor our father. You didn't know my father. <laughs> You're not made of kings, boy, but of common clay. Then Merlin called on King Other's queen, the stepmother of Morgan, who had been banished from the court a few days earlier, and the queen recognized Arthur as her son the moment she saw him. She then declared that Arthur was the only heir to the throne of King Other. In the face of this, Princess Morgan could only leave in frustration, but she would never give up her bid for the throne. Not long after, Morgan returned with Lot. This time, there was even more conflict. Morgan reminds Arthur that if he leaves now, he can't still save his life, otherwise he will only lose everything if he stays. But now Arthur also insisted that he is the rightful heir to the throne, and even directly provoked King Lot. King Lot's expression instantly darkens, and he orders a body to be dragged out It is the guard who was killed by Arthur's sword when he followed Merlin back to the city a few days ago. Lot claimed that it was his son who had been killed, then he had the soldiers drag out a woman. As the sack was removed, Arthur's adoptive mother appeared. Before Arthur could plead for mercy, King Lot stabbed his foster mother to death. Arthur was unable to fight back. King Lot gave him five days to get out of here, otherwise, more people would be killed. Arthur was still grieving the loss of his mother. He began to wonder if he had made the right choice in coming here. He went to the beach alone to think about it. Suddenly, a figure came into view. The blonde woman walks up the beach soaking wet and heads straight for Arthur, then pushes him down. Staring at me, and this is where I go not to be stared at. I can explain. Arthur swore that he had dreamt of this scene not long ago, and he hadn't just been staring at her. He'd only come to the beach to escape reality for a while, because his adoptive mother had just been buried in the hills above him. And when she asked about his mother's death, Arthur told her that he'd gotten into trouble with King Lot, and that made her worry about him, because no one who goes up against King Lot is going to get away with it. Arthur also says that he can only make himself stronger. Suddenly, from the top of a distant mountain comes the call of his adoptive father. Arthur was so excited, he wanted to run there right away. He wanted to ask the woman her name, but she chose to remain mysterious. Arthur then raced to his foster father. The bruised and battered father was also attacked by King Lot. He managed to escape, but his wife left them forever. Father and son bury this hatred deep in their hearts, because they can't fight King Lot with the power they have now. But Merlin said they had one last and only way out and that was to pull down the iron sword stuck in the rushing waterfall. Legend has it that this is the sword of the gods. Mars, the god of war, and the treacherous terrain gives it a symbol of power. The one who can pull out the sword will be recognized by the people as the ruler. Arthur, who was outmatched by Lot, had no choice but to win the hearts and minds of the people. So with the help of his brother Kay, Arthur climbed the cliff step by step to get closer to the sword. Gradually, the bottom of the waterfall was filled with onlookers who wanted to see if Arthur could succeed. Arthur had reached the hardest part of his climb. He grabbed the hilt of the sword and pulled out the Sword of the Gods, a symbol of power. But as it fell, Arthur hit the rocks hard and fell into the water. One of the guards immediately rushed to Arthur's rescue. Merlin went to see if he was alive and ordered a beacon to be lit to publicize Arthur's pulling out of the Sword of the Gods. On the other side, when Morgan and Lot saw the beacon, they immediately realized something was wrong. He has the Sword of the Gods. People will fight for him. You think I don't know that? King Lot violently grabs Princess Morgan by the neck and pins her against the wall. He then whips off her dress in front of all the soldiers and tries to dominate her because she just accused him of being a lazy cunt. Princess Morgan doesn't back down as she swings her hips and keeps pressuring him if he has the guts to do it. But as the soldiers snicker and stare at her with lewd looks, King Lot suddenly drags Morgan away by her hair because he has a more brutal punishment for her. King Lot then ties Morgan's hands to a stick and leaves her in the middle of the wasteland. Actually, he knew that Morgan had seduced him into an alliance in order to use him to eliminate King Arthur's illegitimate son so that she could ascend to the throne with little effort. However, King Lot believes that Morgan has failed to recognize the nature of their alliance and where the true power lies, so he dropped her off in the middle of nowhere for a night of reflection. If she's lucky enough not to be in by the wolves, she'll still have a chance to work with him. As the night wears on, a mysterious mist shrouds Morgan's surroundings. Morgan looks around warily but realizes that it's not the wolves, 
but the devil she's been trading witchcraft with it's a heifer. Although the devil constantly murmurs he is wrong to her. Morgan has no idea who the devil is pointing at. Fortunately, at least she makes it through the night under the devil's protection. The next morning, King Lot wakes her up by stroking her cheek. He expects Morgan, his ally, to be more disciplined after a night of punishment. Since the sword of the gods has been pulled out by Arthur, there is no point for him to give Arthur five dawns to leave the realm. So King Lot decides to attack Arthur tonight. On the other hand, Arthur, who has been in a coma for a day and a night, finally wakes up. He still can't believe he actually drew the sword of the gods. Though he's still a little weak, Merlin insists on organizing Arthur's coronation tonight. Hundreds of warriors have come to see Arthur pull up the sword of the gods and make him king. Morgan arrives at the castle on horseback, but she's here to send a message. Morgan tells Merlin about King Lot's plan to attack tonight, and she leaves with a message wishing them good luck. So Merlin prepares for battle and makes sure the coronation goes off without a hitch. I present to you your undoubted king! And so it was that Arthur was crowned, watched and cheered by the crowd, and then made his proclamation as king. He would not fail to fulfill the high expectations of those present and would rule his people in a new way. Arthur then appointed his brother Kay as marshal, and his foster father and savior Lentes as royal guard. I am Arthur Pendragon, and I am proud to be your king. After the king's coronation, the crowd was in the midst of a joyous party. It was then that Arthur saw the blonde girl who had captivated him, so he went up to her to continue the beautiful encounter that had been interrupted the last time. He finally learns her name, Guinevere. The two of them had a nice conversation, and then they went to the terrace by the sea in the spirit of the drink. Guinevere looked down at the ocean and asked, Would it kill me to jump from here? Next thing you know, Arthur is on the fence. Do you think that sea is down there? Do you want to find out? While the two of them are having a good time, the ambience is suddenly interrupted by the arrival of Lentes, the guard. Arthur wanted to introduce Guinevere to Lentes, but he was embarrassed not to know that they knew each other. This is my betrothed. I am. This truth definitely hit Arthur hard, although Arthur tried to fake a smile to congratulate them on their engagement. He was still upset when he saw their intimate behavior and had to leave. While he is still in the sadness of his lost love, he realizes that the enemy has already entered the party in disguise. The battle begins in an instant. Merlin immediately had Arthur evacuated, but King Lot, who wanted to take Arthur's life, came after him. Arthur's adoptive father immediately rushed out to avenge the murder of his wife. Obviously, the two of them are very different in terms of fighting strength. The arrogant King Lot even put down his sword and stabbed Arthur's foster father with a spear instead. King Lot thought that the killing was over, but Arthur's foster father was able to endure the pain of the spear penetrating his abdomen and approached King Lot a little bit. Then he took out the dagger he had hidden on his body and died with King Lot. King Lot never thought that he would die in such an ungrateful way. Arthur's adoptive father avenged his wife's death and paved the way for Arthur with his life. A woman walks into the jungle late at night looking for the devil she's been trading with. She undresses and tells the devil that she needs more. Tell me what I have to do. Not long ago, King Lot, who was allied with Princess Morgan for the throne, was killed, putting Morgan's ambitious plans on hold. Morgan can only watch as Arthur, the illegitimate son of the former king, takes the throne she so desperately wants. Morgan and Arthur are half-siblings. In fact, Arthur, not wanting to antagonize his sister, suggested that he could share the throne with her. Men are not my way to this. I'll find another way to take it. After leaving Camelot Castle, Morgan went deep into the woods to continue his dealings with the devil. It's always calm before the storm. The biggest blow Arthur had to face was the fact that his beloved Guinevere would be married in his guard Lentis in three days. Guinevere's expectations of this engagement, which she has had since she was a child, are shaken when she meets King Arthur. A wedding, which is to be held in the castle, is a bit awkward for both of them. Just then, Morgan sends her maid to invite Arthur to her castle for dinner. Merlin was still trying to figure out what Morgan was up to, but an unhappy Arthur didn't hesitate to say yes. Merlin has no choice but to accompany him. When the two of them arrive at the castle, 
Morgan is waiting in full costume. I'm honored. Thank you. Morgan's sudden change of attitude to subservience was a surprise to both of them. Merlin was never convinced that she was sincere in her quest for peace. Morgan prepares a sumptuous dinner, but Merlin is too cautious to eat, so Morgan tastes Arthur's soup first. <laughs> and so the dinner went on in such a pleasant atmosphere. After the dinner, Arthur fell asleep in Morgan's castle. Morgan came to visit him in his room late at night. The two of them were now as close as siblings can be without hatred, but this time Morgan approached him with a purpose. On the surface, she said she wanted to get to know her brother and made Arthur drop his defenses. Then she pretended to accidentally cut Arthur's chest when she was about to wipe him. Her ring was then stained with Arthur's blood, and she left the room. Satisfied, Merlin was still standing in the hall, so Morgan invited him for a drink. But after a couple of drinks, Merlin started to lose consciousness. When he realizes that something is wrong, it's too late, because Morgan is already sitting on top of him. Merlin tried his best to stay awake, holding Morgan's head in his hands. He suddenly and unexpectedly realized that it was she who had poisoned King Other. Because the little girl who had disguised herself when Morgan poisoned him was the same girl she had been when she was young. However, the drug in the wine had already taken full effect, causing Merlin to fall heavily to the ground. When he woke up again, he found himself tied to the bed by Morgan. Morgan collected Merlin's hair and nails and began some evil rituals. When he came to his senses, Merlin accused Morgan of having poisoned her father. But Morgan said that the man was not worthy of being her father. Merlin knew that Morgan was deeply hurt and kindly reminded her that the sorcery she was using would not make her strong, but would cost her dearly. But Morgan, determined to take back her throne, doesn't listen. What Merlin doesn't know is that after his poisoning last night, a distraught Arthur has left the castle. After dreaming of Guinevere again, he decides to confess his innermost feelings to Guinevere. On the night of her wedding, the bride secretly gets up and takes the deer's blood. She hid under the bed and pours it on the white sheets. The blood was enough to fool the others. Guinevere and Lentus were childhood sweethearts, betrothed since childhood. But then the handsome King Arthur burst into Guinevere's world. They met on the beach and fell in love at first sight. Arthur was dismayed to learn that Guinevere was betrothed. But his love for Guinevere was uncontrollable. So he snuck into Guinevere's bed on the morning of the wedding. Tell me, you're not thinking of me and I'll leave you alone. Meet me at the beach. Guinevere, after much internal struggle, finally showed up at the beach a short time later. The first thing Arthur said when he saw her was to ask Guinevere not to marry Lintez. He believed that an unspeakable love had sprung up between them, both on the beach where they had first met and at the ball that night at the king's coronation. Guinevere couldn't deny the love, but was adamant that it was too late. Getting married? Don't. Are you asking me as my king? Or as a complete stranger who's only met me twice, who's decided that he can order me about? Arthur questions why she came to this beach, if she didn't have the same feelings for him. You came because you wanted this too. No. The two of them eventually came close to each other and kissed. They gave themselves to each other, body and soul. On that beach, Guinevere then told Arthur that after this one moment, their affair was over and that it would remain a secret in their hearts. After all, she chose to remain married to her childhood sweetheart, Lentes. On their way back, they met a deer that had been shot by an arrow. Guinevere immediately filled a wine bag with deer's blood for her wedding night. Back at the chateau, the atmosphere was one of wedding joy. Arthur was at a loss as to how to face his savior. Lentes, the groom of the evening, Lentes even asked Arthur to perform the wedding ceremony for him, and Arthur could only agree awkwardly. And then, to the sound of a beautiful song, the bride, accompanied by her father, slowly entered the room. Guinevere passed Arthur and came to the groom. Arthur could only bear the pain in his heart and perform the marriage ceremony for the newlyweds. May these rings stand forever as a symbol of your unity and fidelity. May you live and grow old together, knowing only the truth of undying love. Meanwhile, King Arthur's sister, Morgan, began to use Arthur's blood for witchcraft. By doing so, she was able to see what Arthur's eyes had witnessed, and thus learn the secrets hidden within his heart. It is said that the sword lifted by the Lady of the Lake became the weapon of victory for King Arthur, who won 12 major battles in 10 years armed with it. However, the legend of the sword was a scheme concocted by the magician Merlin. After Arthur inherited his father's throne, as a warrior ready to fight, he didn't have a sword to wear as a king, 
the guards recommended one of the best wordsmiths to magician Merlin. He was able to customize a sword to fee each individual. Merlin was ready to leave for the swordsmith, but before he did, he called Arthur aside. He could see Arthur's feelings for Guinevere, but now that Guinevere had become another man's wife, Arthur should break off the affair immediately. We're going to settle our project with misdirected desire. Train hard, I'll return with the sword. On the other hand, the Queen Mother also sensed the unspeakable love between her son Arthur and Guinevere. In order to prevent them from making a big mistake, Queen Mother approached Guinevere early in the morning to talk about her wedding night. But Guinevere said she didn't want to talk about it too much. <sighs> but now that you are married, of course, you'll be coveted more than ever. What do you mean? Oh, the most enticing aspect for any man is the forbidden. But you'll just have to forego the looks from men other than your husband. Queen Mother's words are so profound that she doesn't spell out the problem. But Guinevere knows it all too well. On the other hand, Merlin finally found the sword maker hidden in the mountains. However, this sword maker has a strange personality. When he realizes that Merlin is not making the sword for himself, he immediately pulls out his sword and asks Merlin to leave. Merlin then said the sword was for the new king and that he could provide all the information about the new king, Arthur, so that the swordsmith could make a customized sword for Arthur. Merlin's eloquence finally persuaded the swordsmith to make a customized sword for Arthur. In just one night, the swordsmith had completed his masterpiece. A new sword for a new king. The swordsmith wanted to present the sword to the king himself, but Merlin thought he was not fit to meet the king because of his murderous spirit, and the swordsmith stubbornly refused to hand over the sword. So Merlin was going to use sorcery to take the sword. However, when Merlin cast the spell, he lost control of it and caused the swordsmith to be killed by the fire. When the sword maker's daughter arrived and saw this, she regarded Merlin as her father's murderer, while Merlin was feeling guilty. You never have this sword! When Merlin got over his pain, he chased her deeper into the forest. The little girl ran to the lake and climbed into a boat and rowed to the center of the lake. Merlin, who was right behind her, tried to persuade her to stop, but the angry girl said the sword should go to the bottom of this lake. Merlin had no choice but to use his sorcery again. Gradually, the lake began to freeze over, and Merlin slowly stepped on the ice to get closer to her. The ice hits the hull of the boat, causing the girl and the sword to tumble into the water. She struggled to swim upstream, but in the end, she only managed to lift the sword out of the frowning lake. The girl desperately beat the ice for help, but the ice was too thick for Merlin to break with the hilt of the sword. He can only watch the girl sink to the bottom of the lake. Upon returning to the palace, Merlin chose to hide the tragedy and concocted a legendary tale of the making of the sword. Merlin claimed to have come to a misty lake on his way. When it passed through the mist, he saw a lady in the center of the lake lifting the sword out of the water. I took the sword and thanked her. She smiled and slipped back into the water. And as she did, she said, This is the sword of King Arthur. This is Excalibur. Then Arthur, who had the sword, began his reign, and his sister Morgan, who was to rival him for the throne, was ready for anything. The head man of this village can take the first night of every woman's life. On the night before a woman is to be married, the headman will take her virginity by force. On this day, King Arthur was inspecting the forest when a girl rushed out to ask for help. Help me! My father! He's going to kill him! Arthur immediately took the girl and rode off. He then saw a group of men hanging a man, so he ordered in the king's name that the man be put down. The villagers did so, accusing him that they were hanging a murderer, and that it was a just sentence, so there was no need to bother the king at all. But Arthur insisted that they could not execute anyone in private, so Arthur told them to go to the castle tomorrow, and the case would be heard by Arthur. Early the next morning, Arthur had a court set up in the castle. Both sides of the trial were present. The new head of the village accused the man of killing his brother. The previous head of the village, and the man accused did not deny it. The new chief said that his brother was there to collect the rent. The man looked at his daughter, who was standing next to him, and didn't respond positively. He didn't seem to want the trial to continue. You'd rather be executed than talk. But you think talking will make a difference? You're just using me here to test your justice. Are you going to stand guard when all this is over? No! So no point in talking! Arthur realized that there was more to this than meets the eye, but the men didn't trust him, so he ordered a temporary recess. Arthur was going to look to the girl for a break in the case, so Arthur asked Guinevere to help him talk to the girl. Guinevere, as a older sister, told the girl that Arthur was a good man and that he was willing to listen to people's problems, but the girl says that no one can help them and that it's all because she ran away. Headman takes every girl she 
she becomes a woman. Inavir is surprised and says that isn't anyone going to stop this ridiculous behavior. But the girl shakes her head in despair, because as paupers, they are no match for the powerful family. Kinavir immediately told Arthur about the situation, and the man finally confessed to Arthur after taking his daughter away. It turns out that he didn't want to tell the truth in public, because he didn't want his daughter to know where she came from. <laughs> it's in your... I'll have lost her! It's not blood that ties you together. It's the memories you share. Having grown up in foster care, Arthur understands this. The girl also came forward to tell her father that she already knew everything, but she would only recognize him as her father for the rest of her life. Arthur then reveals this absurdity in the courtroom. The new headman, however, did not change his expression, saying that this was the way of life for his village. Arthur immediately decreed that the custom would no longer exist, and he executed the man by banishing him from the village. The new headman, of course, was not happy with the outcome of the trial. Because if that's Camelot justice, You'd be a short time on the throne. Arthur, who had just become king, was still insisting on justice, but his sister Morgan, who had been working against him, was more skilled at winning people's support than he was. The old nun took out her gold coins and placed them in front of the hitman. They tell me who you want to be, Tim. Me. Soon after, the old nun was brought to Princess Morgan with her body drenched in blood. Morgan was in a state of anxiety at the sight. Little did everyone know that this was all a scheme by the two of them. Don't waste the moment, child. Use it. This is the same nun that King Other sent Morgan to the convent 15 years ago and has been with Morgan for the past 15 years. She's become like family to Morgan and the nun chose to her herself in order to help Morgan win the hearts and minds of the people and take the throne. First, they had their men pose as bandits and pillage the trade routes, which made the people fearful. Morgan pretended to comfort the people and said she would send a messenger to King Arthur to report the incident. However, after a long time, no help was received, and the people gradually lost their trust in King Arthur. At this point, Morgan and the nuns put on a dramatic show. At the feast, Morgan gave a rousing speech. That we stand on the very brink. Everything that was once so secure under my father's reign is now under threat. I am loyal to my brother, but I fear the future. What do we mean to the king if he's too busy for us? I hear your woes, and they grieve me. But know that tonight I make an oath, a pledge to you all, that I will protect you with my life's blood. The Morgan called the hitman. The nun had bribed up to the stage. The nun immediately accuses him of hurting her. Before the man can retort with the truth, Morgan kills him. Morgan then declares to the crowd that this is what will happen to anyone who commits a crime in the future, and that she will protect anyone who gets hurt. I, Morgan, daughter of Uther, give him to you. In this way, Morgan wins the support and love of the people through her schemes and plans. Like Arthur, she set up a court in the castle to help the people with their problems. People in need could come to her for help every day. People lined up to fill her halls, hoping that Princess Morgan would listen to their problems. On this day, Morgan was met by a family of three. The woman said she and her son had been separated from his father for seven years. In those seven years, the father had never cared for his son, but now he wanted to take him to work on his farm. So the woman wants custody of her son, and without saying a word, Morgan steps forward and offers to buy the boy as a servant in the palace for five goats. His mother immediately rejects the deal, but his father begins to haggle and three sheep. Boy, is yours for that? Immediate payment. No! Good! The child stays with his mother! Morgan thought the fact that this man would sell his son for a few goats meant that he was not worthy of being a father, so she had him thrown out immediately, though she spent most of her days dealing with trivial matters. Morgan gradually built trust in the people's hearts. At this point, Princess Morgan seemed far more reliable than King Arthur, who was still having an affair with his friend's wife. The guard hid behind the door and peeped through it to spy on the princess in her bath. However, the next moment, the princess put a knife to his neck. Please, I beg you. What were you doing with her hand before you used it to sell my dress? Caught in the act of voyeurism, the guard can only keep pleading for the princess's forgiveness and expressing his sincere love for her. Morgan then asked him, with interest, how he would prove his love. I'll do anything. Anything. Come with me. 
In fact, Morgan soon found an opportunity to take advantage of the car. She set up a sham banquet and invited her half-brother, King Arthur, to her castle. Though she and King Arthur were, were over the throne, Morgan knows that her brother, a bastard, is desperate for family, so he will accept her invitation. Everything goes as Morgan expects, and King Arthur makes his way to her appointment in the hope that he will be able to bury the hatchet with her, although magician Merlin is still wary of her. He wants to see what Morgan is up to. Morgan had waited so long for Arthur and the others to arrive at her castle, so she dressed up and went to greet her brother respectfully. Welcome, my king. Your brother. Morgan even went so far as to approach her stepmother and apologize for kicking her out of the palace. Morgan wanted to make amends and be forgiven for the mistakes she had made. The dinner was prepared with great pomp and circumstance, and Morgan raised her glass to welcome her brother. Brother and king, I stand here as your sister and loyal subject, offering my love and devotion. The king! The king! Arthur was quick to echo his sister Morgan's words. He said he couldn't bring peace to the land on his own, so he needed family and allies. Only Merlin and Queen Mother, sitting on the sidelines, wondered what Morgan was up to tonight. In a harmonious atmosphere, Morgan had arranged for some sexy girls to perform. The guards Arthur brought with him were mesmerized by them and took them to their rooms for a good time. With everyone on their guard, Morgan tells her nun that it's time to get moving. I don't know. The castle was suddenly attacked by an unknown party, causing the fire to spread rapidly. This has caused panic among the people. It took a lot of effort to put out the fire, but the most important thing now was to find out who had attacked them. Merlin and his guards speculated that it was their longtime rival, Altwolf. Altwolf had fought King Other many times before, so perhaps he was now about to declare war on King Other's son Arthur and take over Pendragon Castle and its territories. Then Morgan showed her loyalty by saying that all her troops would be at Arthur's disposal. And Arthur trusted his sister more than ever. As the guards prepared to guard the gates, a wounded soldier rode into the sea. The same man who had coveted Morgan's beauty and would have done anything for her. He takes the form of a scout, as Morgan had told him to, and says that the soldiers of Aldwulf are preparing to attack, and that there are enough of them to level the city. They all took him at his word. Morgan then took the liberty of sending a vanguard out of the city to attack the enemy in secret. The remaining soldiers in the city began to prepare. The women also picked up their bows and arrows and prepared to fight. But the next morning, only three of Morgan's men returned. Although they were heavily wounded, they also brought back good news that they had successfully repelled the enemy. Everyone was delighted at the news. Arthur is also grateful to his sister and trusts her more. Sister, we are in your debt. Arthur was too naive to realize that his sister Morgan had set him up. He even went so far as to invite Morgan to return to Camelot with him, saying that he would protect her. What he didn't realize was that Morgan's schemes had only just begun. She refused Arthur's invitation on the surface, but in reality, she was in the procession back to Camelot in a different way. A woman looks in the mirror and practices smiling over and over again. Because this face is not her own, Princess Morgan possessed the witchcraft to change her face. That day she stopped her stepmother, Icrane, who was returning to the castle with King Arthur as Queen Mother. What is it about you? What is it about that face that makes men weak? After exchanging pleasantries with Icrane, Morgan's face was transformed into her stepmother's and she followed her brother back to Camelot Castle as Queen Mother. The real Icrane is imprisoned by Morgan in Pendragon. Upon awakening the next morning, the new Morgan struggles to adapt to her new appearance reflected in the mirror. Morgan's impersonation of Icrane's gentle and dignified appearance fooled everyone. Even Icrane's own son, who didn't notice the difference. Morgan's purpose in entering Camelot as Queen Mother Icrane was to discover the secrets of the place and to disturb the peace and quiet of the place. To her surprise, the rumor had surfaced that Moy magician Merlin had come to Icrane's room. It turns out that Merlin and Icrane have recently developed feelings for each other. Morgan is surprised and continues to play the role of Igraine without a hitch. After breakfast, the two of them talk about their trip to Morgan's castle. It turns out that Merlin knew that everything was Morgan's trick, and he was convinced that Morgan still wanted the throne. Merlin says that if the former king had been in power, he would have gotten rid of Morgan without him realizing it. Taking on the enemy by any means necessary is the way of the world for King Other. And Morgan is a very dangerous woman, because Merlin believes that if Morgan can kill her own father, she can't do anything. I don't see why that's true. He was your husband. Yes. And I wasn't blind to his faults. Uther beat her in front of me. And then he humiliated her. Rejected her. Morgan's genuine defense of herself 
causes her to almost forget who she is at the moment, and then she immediately changes the subject. On the other side of the room, Icarine, who is being held captive by Morgan and Pendragon, is being questioned by the nun. The nun asked Icarine why she hadn't said a word in Morta's favor all those years ago. We are all the victims of our own actions. It is your own decisions that have brought you here. Perhaps if you were to confess, you would find solace. The nun who had treated Morgan like her own daughter hated Icrane just as much. So she instructed the guards not to speak to Icrane and not to comply with any of her requests. If Icrane caused any more trouble, she could be eliminated by force. But the guards began to have ulterior motives. The Honorable Queen, Mother lured the guards into sex in order to escape her imprisonment. I swear you'll release me. Him first. The guards began to kiss and assault her roughly. Queen Mother made out with him in pain and then stabbed him several times with the dagger she had at her waist. After much humiliation, Icrain finally escaped imprisonment at the Chateau de Camelot. Morgan, who had assumed Icrain's form, was at work again, knowing that Guinevere and Arthur have an unusual relationship, which is why she is trying to get closer to Guinevere and lure her into revealing her secret. Finally, Morgan learns the secret of Guinevere's affair with Arthur from her. It was my wedding day. I had doubts. We were together. Please don't doubt me. Not. You are a good and faithful woman. But Morgan soon reneged on her promise to Guinevere. She came to the church to pray, pretending to accidentally run into Guinevere's husband Lentes. Then she accidentally revealed a shocking secret. Guinevere is lucky to have you. Oh, a man with a big enough heart to forgive. What do I have to forgive? Arthur and Guinevere. Lentes was very confused by what she meant and it was clear that he was unaware of his wife's infidelity. Morgan immediately apologized for the slip of the tongue and said it was her mistake. But Lentes hears what she says and realizes that something is wrong and asks what happened. Morgan was flustered and said she thought they had already told Lentes about the incident. What happened between them on your wedding day? What are you talking about? Oh gosh. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thus, Morgan has successfully provoked a conflict between the main characters of the love triangle. When she returns to the room, she finds Merlin waiting for her. Merlin takes Morgan for Igraine and expresses his solitude and loneliness to her. In return, Morgan makes love to him and surrenders her body to him. On the other hand, the real Igraine was galloping back to Camelot, but when she arrived early the next morning, she was greeted by a woman with her exact face. Good morning. Queen Mother escapes her imprisonment, only to see this woman in the hall wearing the same face as hers. It makes her think she is insane. She is so frightened that she flees back to her room, only to awaken Merlin, with whom she had sex last night, but he notices that Icrane is very different from yesterday. Now she's in a state of shock and has a cut on her face. I saw myself. Icrane describes in horror how she just stared at herself and her imprisonment at Castle Pendragon for the past two days. Though Merlin collapses at the insanity of it all, he calms Icrane down while trying to make sense of it all. Then he finally realizes that it wasn't Icrane who had sex with him last night. But Morgan, who used witchcraft to assume Igraine's shape. At the same time, Morgan, who was wearing Igraine's face, returns to her original shape when her magic runs out. Then she immediately rides back to her castle. Actually, her disguise of lurking in Arthur's castle for the past two days had created some problems for Arthur. For example, after Morgan's sowing discord, Lentes, the guard, knew about his wife's illicit relationship with King Arthur, but he still hoped that his wife could give him a negative answer. He takes out a Bible and asks Guinevere to swear, but Guinevere can't bear to say anything against her will, which makes her falter when swearing. Eventually she chose to tell her husband about her affair with King Arthur. It turns out that she had sex with King Arthur once before she married Lentus. The reason she didn't tell her husband was because she didn't want to upset him. However, when Guinevere tries to approach her husband to ask for forgiveness, he avoids her in disgust. He also wants his wife to be truthful about when she had sex with King Arthur. I did a terrible thing, but I'm still your wife. You're not my wife. You're the king's whore. Lentes is already disappointed in his wife, but he hates his friend King Arthur even more. He is on his way to settle the score with King Arthur when he runs into Merlin. Lentes told him that it had been cuckolded, and Merlin knew that Morgan was behind it. So Merlin persuaded Lentes to go back to his room to calm down and let him deal with King Arthur. Soon Merlin scolds Arthur for not being able to control his desires, but he also urges him not to admit it. Because as king, Arthur is only responsible for his realm, 
It is also at this point that Bardon's war breaks out. With Morgan's meddling, Bardon is the main trade route into Camelot Castle and is strategically important. If it is lost, the consequences will be unimaginable. So Arthur's priority is to lead the troops to quell the war. But the conflict between Arthur and Lintess has not yet been resolved to go to war together, which is also a great threat to Arthur's security. However, this is all in Morgan's scheme. She wants to take away Arthur's support so that he will never return from the battlefield and then she will be able to sit on the throne in the name of the queen. After stirring up trouble between Arthur and his friend, her next target is Merlin, Arthur's magician. After escaping her captivity, the queen mother returns to the castle to accuse Morgan of being a sorceress who is using witchcraft to hold the royal family hostage. But Morgan, wearing an earpiece, said the accusations were false, and the people who believed Morgan sided with her. Then Queen Mother Ocrine claimed that there were signs of witches in the room where she was being held. Little did she know, that Morgan had already remodeled the room to destroy the evidence. Is she often like this? This would create the impression that Igrain was not in her right mind. Merlin knew there was no point in arguing, so he decided to take Morgan back to Camelot for questioning in the name of the king. This played into Morgan's hands, as the people who had been sheltered by Morgan had already taken sides with her. Their homes are being attacked, and you turn your force on me instead of protecting them? The entire country bleeds. You storm in here with your insane charges. The people are with me, sorcerer. The guards then tied Merlin's and Igraine's hands with twine and pulled them away behind horses in order to protect Morgan. Morgan again uses their accusations to bolster the public's trust in her. She says that she is going to Camelot to expose the sorcerer's evil to King Arthur, and then she will help him restore order and save the people from their plight. Let all who seek a safe harbor find one with me. Morgan then leads Merlin and Ocrane on a parade, buying people's support along the way. Merlin realizes that he has been caught in Morgan's trap, but for the moment, they can only endure the humiliation and put their hopes in Arthur. They hoped that Arthur would be able to quell the war and return safely. Arthur had already arrived in Bardon. Although he was clearly outnumbered by the enemy, he decided to take advantage of his geographical position to fight to the death. As Arthur had brought with him some of his best soldiers, he quickly overpowered the enemy when the enemy leader ordered them to retreat. Arthur's brother Kay was wounded by a hidden arrow, so they rushed back to the hut. Arthur orders everyone to evacuate with Kay, and he will draw the attention of the enemy ahead. Coward! Is that all you've got? This land belongs to your king, and we will protect it to the death! His declaration is passionate and courageous, but can Arthur win the battle when he's the only one left? The woman is resplendent in her finery as she prepares for her own coronation. She walks slowly towards the throne in front of the crowd, and then a nun crowns her. With this crown, I anoint you, Morgan, first queen of the Britons. But then there was a sudden burst of applause from the crowd. Her brother Arthur, who had died on the battlefield, had miraculously returned to the crowd. Not long ago, Arthur had led troops to Bardon to quell the war, but in the end, only his bloody king's sword was returned to the palace. It was assumed that King Arthur had died in battle. Morgan, too, what tears of anguish. While the people were in a panic, the nun came forward and said that the kingdom could not live without a monarch, and that they needed to take refuge in a monarch, and that the only person who could succeed the throne now was Morgan. You owe it to your father and your brother not to leave these people unprotected out of this darkness the realm must know its first queen yes then i accept in my brother's memory to carry on the pendragon line morgan uses these tactics to gain the support of all the people and is about to take the throne in name only what she didn't know was that arthur was still alive in this war arthur showed unprecedented courage on the battlefield after everyone retreated, Arthur still defended his position and created countless traps to defeat many enemies who wanted to sneak up on him. But he was alone and outnumbered by the enemy. As Arthur was knocked down by the enemy, the king's sword was seized, but Arthur took advantage of the situation to escape. The enemy chased after him and fell into the trap he had set. So Arthur managed to kill the enemy and survived. But the leader, who got the king's sword, was arrogant enough to think that Arthur was dead and immediately took the news back to the capital and passed it on to Morgan. By the next morning, when the enemy army was ready to invade Bourbon, Kay returned to the battlefield with his guards, and together they defeated the enemy. But at the end of the battle, there was one enemy left, who aimed an arrow at Arthur from the shadows. When Lentus saw it, 
he stepped forward and deflected the arrow for Arthur. Before he died, he told Arthur to take good care of his wife Guinevere. They returned to the castle, just in time for the climax of the play Morden was directing. Arthur reveals to the public that his sister Morgan is plotting war and rebellion against the king. Not only will Morgan be denied the throne, but she will be executed for her crimes. But just then, the nun comes forward and says that it was all her plan and Morgan knew nothing about it. Was this all her own doing? I would never plot against you, my brother. The nun confessed to the treason charge, thus saving Morgan's life, but Arthur declared that Morgan had been stripped of her pin dragon name and that she had no right to call herself by that name. That name is my birthright. You will not take my name! You hear me? Arthur! I am the dragon! You are nothing! Even though Morgan is now alone in her fight, she will not give up. After everything had settled down, Guinevere came to Arthur's room late at night. I know it's wrong. I don't think I can be alone tonight. Just tonight. Arthur took in Guinevere, who was devastated by the death of her husband. However, Guinevere wakes up with a nosebleed and immediately gets up and runs out of the room. As the scene changes, we see Guinevere turning into Morgan with a satisfied smile. Morgan's incestuous behavior is due to the fact that she heard the demon's message again at the old nun's grave.